You're very welcome to uh, Radio Spoil, Mick Rooney, investigative journalist. Uh, this is episode 42. Uh, thank you all for the recent uh, subscribes and the uh, channel support and all your comments. Uh, I do love reading them. Uh, please understand, uh, we're now getting so many that I don't always get through to reply to all of them. Uh, usual stuff appearing up here somewhere. Enough of that. Uh, let's move on. Um, we are into uh, another uh, deep dive timeline and analysis. 26 years ago, and on this date, as I record, February the 9th, um, Fiona Sinnott went missing in Wexford. Or case summary. That's Fiona there. And Kiran from Irish Cold Cases and Ireland's Vanishing Triangle, the website, will be joining us when we get into the timeline. But first of all, I'm just going to go through a summary on the case. Now, at the time of her disappearance, Fiona Sinnott was living in the rural village of Ballyhit, Broadway, County Wexford, Ireland, some 120 kilometres south of Dublin City. Fiona was a young single mother and her daughter Emma was 11 months old at the time of her mother's disappearance. 19-year-old Fiona Sinnott spent the night of Sunday, February the 8th, socialising with a group of friends in Butler's Pub in Broadway, Wexford, not far from her rented home. I think it was about 22, 23 minutes distance away. Fiona's friends described Fiona as being happy that night and in good spirits. However, her friends would later tell Gardaí that Fiona was also re complaining of pain in one of her arms. Fiona had been the victim of domestic violence in the past and the report of pain in her arm would later raise suspicions of Gardaí when they came to examine this case. Also in Butler's pub that night was Fiona's ex-boyfriend and the father of her child, Emma. He did not join Fiona and her friends and spent the night drinking at the bar. At roughly midnight, Fiona left Butler's pub with her ex-boyfriend and nobody else. Her ex-boyfriend would later tell Gardaí that he and Fiona walked a short distance to her home, where he too spent the night, but on Fiona's sofa while she slept upstairs in her bedroom. He would also tell Gardy that on the following morning, which was Monday the 9th of February, Fiona was still complaining of the pain in her arm and wanted to visit a doctor, and that she would hitch a lift to the doctor's office. Fiona's ex-boyfriend then gave her five pounds, and he himself was picked up by his mother at around 9.30 a.m. His mother drove him back to their home in nearby Cotstown, where their child Emma had spent the previous night. Now Fiona never arrived at the doctor's office. No sightings of her hitchhiking have ever been reported, nor has anyone ever come forward to Gardy stating that they gave Fiona a lift that morning. Now, in the days after Fiona's disappearance, neighbours reported seeing numerous black bin bags outside of her home in Ballyhit. When the Gardaí searched Fiona's home and forensically examined it, they discovered no evidence of foul play. However, the investigators were struck by how clean the house was, considering the fact that a single mother lived there with her 11-month-old daughter. Fiona's landlord would later tell Gardaí that whenever he visited Fiona's home, there would be bits and pieces everywhere, as would be expected in any house with such a young baby. Fiona's family would also report the odd, clean and organised nature of our rented home after her disappearance. A few weeks after Fiona vanished, a local farmer approached Gardy with information that was relevant to the case. The farmer told him that whilst attending to his cattle, he found numerous black bin bags on his property. He did open some of the bags and found letters addressed to Fiona Sinnott. Unfortunately, when the farmer found this evidence, he was unaware of Fiona's disappearance. He presumed it to be just another case of illegal dumping. And at that time in Ireland, that, that was quite widespread. And he went on to burn the black bags. Tragically, no trace or evidence relating to Fiona Sinnott has ever been found since. Uh, we're going to go into uh, one of the early uh, news footages of this case. And then we're going to uh, bring in um, Kieran, Kieran MacDonald from Irish Cold Cases and Ireland's Vanishing Triangle. 
And uh, then we're really going to get into our deep dive of the timeline. Fiona Sinnott disappeared without a trace over 19 years ago. At the time, she was living in a rented house in Broadway, County Wexford, with her baby daughter. On Sunday, the 8th of February 1998, the 19-year-old was socialising with friends at Butler's Pub in Broadway. She left the pub at around midnight. It was the last confirmed sighting of the woman. Garthy say that a male and female were seen on the road near Kisha Cross in Broadway at midnight and two young men in their late teens or early 20s were also spotted in the area, but none of those four people have come forward. 459 inquiries have been conducted to date and over 355 statements have been taken. Speaking to 3 News, Fiona's mother Mary Sinnott has said that there are people out there who know what happened to her daughter. Sometimes I hope she's still alive, like, you know, but um, I have my suspects as well. We would be very grateful if they forward us and with answers, you know, if they, if they knew anything at all. I think it'll only be right. Today, Garthy say they are actively progressing the investigation into Fiona's disappearance and they're urging anyone with information, particularly people who felt they could not come forward at the time, to make contact. Garthy from the National Bureau of Criminal Investigation began digging inside the field yesterday afternoon as part of their ongoing search into the disappearance of Fiona Sinnott. Fiona Sinnott was last seen alive just a few miles from here in February 1998, leaving this pub in the village of Broadway with her ex-boyfriend. Nearly eight years on, there have been no sightings of the mother of one. Fiona was the, the baby of the family. She was very protected by her family, like her brothers and sisters would have always looked out for her. She lit up your heart like that type of person she was. It's like that photograph, like, you know, making a face. Mischievous at times as well, like, you know, she's sneaking to farmer's fields, jump on the bales and all of whatever. She's real bubbly, like. She was the nearest to the school, but she was the last to enter the classroom. And I would be like, oh, God, here I go again now. And she'd sit beside me and she'd copy me homework. I'd be like, oh my God, <laughs> here we go again, like. Bubbly, bubbly girl, does she do anything for anybody, like, that kind of way. She was definitely daddy's girl, all right. She's real popular. She's always the lively one out of all of us. Everyone loved being around her. My little baby sister, also my best friend. She was my pet anyway, I tell you that, my little pet. She was looked after, you know. Yeah, we all looked after her. Really. Fiona Sinnott disappeared without a trace over 19 years ago. It's hard to come down to a place where you know she spent her last few months. Something you see in movies, you don't expect your family to go through it. One never knows what's around the corner. This to me was dear to be solved, and I believe it's still dear to be solved. You can be in a very peaceful, sleepy village, and things can happen that could surprise many people. The hardest part was going away, not finding her. You can't grieve when someone's missing. Okay, so Kieran has just joined us now uh, online. Um, Kieran, uh, Fiona Sinnott, I suppose. Yeah. Before we get into it, uh, uh, initial thoughts on this case. Yeah, how's it going? Thanks, Mick, for having us back. Um, well, I suppose, like one thing that just struck me there, having done the Kira Breen case last week, it's somewhat a similar case. Like they were. Um, both involved with older men they were teenagers and it was um not too far after was it really it was only about a year was it uh, yeah was yeah we're, we're in the same vicinity of 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 yeah uh, a, 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 a year yeah or, or literally even less than a year months um yeah, yeah and, uh, it's 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 like and and it's not for anybody listening or watching we're not doing this deliberately, but we have saw a pattern coming up, and I'll talk to this later when we get to the conclusion part. But there is a pattern sort of emerging here with a number of these cases. And I was going to say, Mick, just on that subject, um, 
I suppose you should, you should stay at the start. Like, there's no point in linking this to like quote unquote Ireland's oh, fashion. No, we'll, we'll we'll say all that on on like Mo, Mo, yeah. more times often. We're saying that not just on every second case, but probably three or four out of every five cases we do now. We're saying that. And listen, yeah. hello everybody. This ain't anything to do with the Ireland's vanishing triangle. But or a look, certain individual, individual or, or a certain in, a yeah. certain in in Mr. Murphy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so like him again. All right, let's go. I was glad again. Another teenager yeah. as well. Like, I, I always think, kind of at the time, we kind of got a bit lost in the media or whatever. Like that, there's a Jacob, Kira Breen, and then um, Fiona Sin. They're all teenagers. Like, yeah, yeah, they yeah, yeah. They're, they're all they're all teenagers. And, and like I reminded uh, people at the top of the uh, program when we started, we're recording this. And just another reminder. On February the 9th, which is exactly the 26th anniversary of uh, Fiona uh, Sinnott uh, going um, missing. Look, let's get straight into it. We're off. Fiona Sinnott grew up in a traditional Irish family household in County Wexford, Ireland, to parents Pat and Mary Sinnott. Born in 1979 and the youngest in the family, Fiona had four siblings. Two sisters, Diane and Caroline, and two brothers, Seamus and Norman. She was initially a quiet, independent, but bubbly teenager for those who knew her well. At the time of her disappearance, February 1998, she was thinking about training as a chef. Uh, this is Sean Carroll. You're going to hear an awful lot more about Sean Carroll. And this is Fiona in the picture that you're seeing here. Uh, and the background to that relationship. In recent months, Fiona had separated from her boyfriend and the father of her infant child, Emma. The separation was considered amicable and daughter Emma spent time staying with both the Sinnott and Carroll families for the first year of her life up to 1998. Mm-hmm. <coughs> Sean Carroll and Fiona Sinnott met when she was 16 years of age. He was almost 10 years older and they shared the same passions for music and motorbikes. And I think that's... Fiona in the picture you see there on that uh, rather gorgeous machine. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know what make it is. I'm not big up onto bikes. I'd, I'd say um, Sean Phelan, if he's listening in, would immediately identify uh, what bike that is. I'd say you get a fair speed out of that anyway. You certainly would. Yeah. February 1997. After an on off relationship over three years, Fiona Sinnott and Sean Carroll move into a flat in Georgia Street, Wexford, and celebrate the birth of their daughter, Emma, on February the 28th, 1997. Neighbours in the area will later recount in interviews with Gardy that they were aware the couple were not getting along well and regularly they would hear shouting and doors banging in the flat. Close friends of Fiona would state that she became quieter and days could go by without contact. June 1997 The couple and baby Emma move again into a rented house in Ballyhit, Wexford. It's a renewed start but it does nothing to resolve a downward spiralling relationship and the realities of what is really going on. Even Fiona's family are not fully aware of all the circumstances. Uh, We're going to do an insert here and this is um, inside Fiona's house. Actually, physically see her stand there making a cup of tea. There's the original chaise lounge. I can't believe that's still there. Yeah, that's it. Twenty odd years later. Yeah, that's crazy. You can imagine like Fiona sitting yeah. down with her legs spread out mm-hmm. here, and then the child sitting on her lap in the middle, and then looking forward, forward to the TV and watching cartoons. Yeah. <laughs> November 1997. Just before we go into our next insert, the couple finally separated after a particularly volatile period. And we're going to talk more about that shortly. But um, in this insert, you're going to hear just a touch of a sense in January 1998 of what was going on in the relationship as she talks to a a family member. And this, thankfully, uh, to the uh, Sinnott family comes from 
uh, family um, their their own family archives and video footage they took of um, meetings ad hoc. Here we go. He said to me, that's what no, he said to me that he wasn't going to leave. He said he's, he's just going to really, really shit start He said to me something like, oh, man, of course he is. Really? Why, yeah. like? Because he just doesn't like you. Know. He'd be like, Charlie, like, five people should tell you, like, I would be able to look at him. Like, but I tried, like, before he was, like, so I got come back to him again, right? Uh, February the 6th, 1998. This is a Friday. Okay, sorry, Mick, to yeah. interrupt. I was going to say, oh, yeah, yeah, I never apologise for interrupting because <laughs> I'll just go and go and go. <laughs> well, I was going to say, you know, fair play to the family for uh, documenting all that stuff, like, especially in... Yeah, in and, the, and, and, and I'm sure there are, the there's other footage they have of meetings, family celebrations, just cursory, ad hoc um, conversations that... Uh, Fiona had with her brothers and sisters that we are not, and probably rightfully so, are not privy to. We're only seeing a very short snippet that the family um, allowed to be released. But it's uh, very smart because one day you never know, it just could matter. In you court, never, you know? never know. You never, yeah. never know. <laughs> so, February the 6th, 1998, it's a Friday. Okay, put yourselves in that mind. Fiona enjoys a welcome night out with friends in Tusker Rock Hotel, Ross Lair. That's about six and a half kilometres from Ballyhit, her home, to attend a local organised pool tournament. Now, I don't know whether she was participating in the pool tournament or she was just going there as a night out to watch it. She is attempting to find her feet again after her relationship breakup. Fiona has recently taken up a job in a local pub restaurant to help pay the rent. Fiona and her friends had taken a local minibus service to get to the hotel in Rosslare. Later, she spends the night with a Welsh truck driver in his cab. During the night, they are disturbed by banging on the side of the cab and shouting. Following Fiona's disappearance, Gardy tracked the driver to Wales and interviewed him. He recounts to them how Fiona identified her ex-boyfriend, Carol, outside the truck on the evening of that February 6th that she warned the driver Carol was possessive and aggressive and often followed her to places she went he decided the truck driver to drive away and drop her closer to home Kiltrain in the early hours of the next morning away from Carol local whispers in Ballyhead would later dismiss the truck driver's account claiming either in defence of Fiona that you would never have such a liaison or that any truck driver ever drove down past Fiona's home in the early hours of February the 7th and neighbours would have heard such a large vehicle. But again, you see, the problem with village whispers. Nowhere in the truck driver's statement did he ever claim to have dropped Fiona to her street and front door. Rather, no. he was concerned about the behaviour of the man outside the vehicle and that for his concern of her that he drove uh, away from the area, um, you know, just to get her closer like, to home. Uh, this thing, like somebody had to hear or somebody had to see. Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. You, that's just not necessarily the case. Like, no, you know? no, and not in the early hours of the morning. Yeah, like not to go back to another case, but you know, the there's a Jacob case. People always mm. say, "Oh, how does nobody see her getting abducted or anything like that?" It could, in, br in, in broad daylight, I know. Yeah. I, I've, we've been down this road before. It happens. Not everything's bound to be seen, unfortunately. Yeah, I yeah. heard. You know? Philip Cairns abducted in broad yeah. daylight. We have countless cases of people being abducted in broad daylight, and apparently, no one saw anything. Yeah, and then the next thing somebody says, oh, somebody had to have seen something. And yeah. not no, they like, didn't. No, they didn't. Not every single time. No, no, no way. Gary would later eliminate the truck driver, who would be identified as Gary James, from any involvement when the vehicle, tachographs and job logs would reveal the driver was on the continent at the time of Fiona's disappearance. And that, of course, was the evening of February the 8th into February the 9th. That was three days later. Now, going back to February the 8th, 1998, this is two days after 
that event with the truck driver. It's Sunday, Sunday evening. Fiona meets three female friends, Nora, Joan and Martina, in our local pub, Butler's. Her daughter Emma is staving, staying over with Kitty and Sean, that's Sean's senior, Carol, the parents of her ex-boyfriend, Sean, Jr. The Carroll family live about 16 kilometres away from Fiona's rented house in Ballyhit, and this is Fiona's uh, rented house. Uh, quite a quite a nice, attractive um, area, and you can yeah. imagine why she probably had to take on um, a part-time restaurant job um, because I'd say even back in 1998, that cost a, a few yeah. quid to 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 rent. Lo- yeah, she lived lo- quite lovely a, place. Quite in- quite an adult's life didn't she like a lot yeah of yeah 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 and, and, and we see that with how many people sandra collins taken on a very adult life at such an early age i think <laughs> yeah, did fiona sin at the, the house did that recently come on the market or something like that um i certainly came across it on the market i don't know how long ago that is but in, in fairness now in fairness it could it, it it's possibly passed through different hands from the original oh, landlord yeah, to, so it's yeah. it's probably been previously on the market uh, going right back to 1998. Yeah. So, during the evening, she calls her family home. She briefly, this is when she's in Butler's, she briefly speaks to her eldest sister, Caroline, and then asks to speak to her brother, Seamus. You're going to hear about Seamus later on. She wants him to head down and join them. But he is very tired after a long boating shift as a local fisherman and is working very early the following day as well. Totally understandable why he didn't take up the opportunity to have a night out it is the last time any family member ever speaks to Fiona this is remember on the phone within the pub on a landline to landline to this day Seamus has always questioned that phone call and whether it was Fiona's way of telling him that she was uneasy that night Fiona leaves butlers after closing time to walk home her friends want to head on to a disco in Rosslair I don't know whether it was the same um, disco from the February 6th or not. But Fiona declines and instead decides to head home to her house in Ballyhit. However, her ex-boyfriend, Sean Carroll, has also turned up at the pub butlers that evening and sits at the bar alone without disturbing Fiona and her three friends, Nora, Joan and Martina. Sean Carroll's account of that evening begins to unravel and other people and staff are later interviewed by Gardy. From witness reports, at some point later that evening, one of Fiona's friends asked Sean Carroll if he would walk her home because the rest of them are heading on to the disco. Carroll will alter earlier statements provided to Gardy. At one point, saying he only met Fiona outside Butler's and offered to walk her home because her arm was still paining her. This conflicted with Fiona's friend's statements that he was asked. Fiona did not confide in all of her friends about her abuse in the past year, so it's important to not judge her, nor her friends, about their actions on the night. When confronted by other witness statements, including his mother, Sean Carroll shifted this same conversation, supposedly that he had with uh, Fiona, back inside the pub and agreed it happened there and confirmed that he phoned his mother and informed her that he would be staying over with Fiona that evening and she could come and pick him up in the morning. That's a bizarre bit of information to get wrong. Yeah, that's not the kind of uh, fox part you want to make in initial statements no. to the Gardaí. And it's not like, yeah, and it's very soon after he's making these statements, like, you know, you don't make that mistake. Yeah. 12.10 a.m. So we're into the very early minutes of February the 9th. 1998. What is clear is that Carol and Fiona Sinnott left Butler's pub together that evening and Fiona took two small packets of peanuts to munch on the way home. The walk was slow as Fiona smoked and she continued to complain of her arm and chest pains. That's according to Carol's statement uh, to uh, Gardy, Irish police. Uh, you can just briefly see there from that image. Butler's to Fiona's house. It's about a 22 minute walk. <coughs> There is an alternative walk. It's not much more, maybe three, 23, 24 minutes, but it's a more roundabout way. The belief is, and you'll hear this from another witness statement, 
that she went that sort of in the direction of the map north on the blue dotted map that that's the way she moved to our house rather than the southern point down by um, I think it's Ballycushel Lane in later uh, Gaudi uh, this is sorry Mick that's yeah. probably an ignorant question because I'm, I'm from Dublin but you, oh, you I'm from Dublin walked. as well here you go yeah so you couldn't have walked across the fields right no that no you couldn't have walked across the fields and oh. I think our out eyewitness statements will pretty much tell us that which direction she was going which is what the Gardaí believe yeah so you can uh, eliminate that like there yeah. would have been never bulls or war or whatever <laughs> yeah yeah know. anything like that and this the, again we we're going to hear about the searches as well in this area this whole area was searched Gardaí mm -hmm. knew her movements on the night in later Gardaí interviews Carol will state that he slept on the couch of Fiona's home in um, Bali Kit that night having set his watch alarm for 9 a.m. the following morning around 12 30 a.m. Kisha cross witnesses a young courting couple hear what seems like screams from a woman and a passing motorist reported a man and a woman arguing on the street and that nearby there was also two other males in their late teens or early 20s none of these people have ever come forward and identified themselves on the morning of February the 9th, 1998, which is a Monday, after his alarm has been set and it alerts him to get up, Sean Carroll claims to see Fiona awake in her bed when soon leaving her house at around 9.15am having spent the night in the couch. He states that she was still talking about pain in her arm and intended getting a ride to see a doctor in nearby Bridgetown and that she had no money and would, would thumb a lift for the 12 kilometre trip at the statement to Garda, Jim Sullivan. No record or appointment or visit to the Bridgetown Doctors Clinic was ever found of Fiona being there. Carol stated that he gave a few pounds in case she needed it for her to travel on the bus. His mother, Kitty Carroll, will later confirm that she picked her son up from Fiona's house around 9.30am and drove him home. She stated in her witness account that she never entered Fiona's house that morning and simply waited outside in her car for her son as arranged on the previous night's phone call. Uh, February 18th, 1998, we're, it's a Wednesday, okay? So we're nearly two weeks beyond uh, Fiona's disappearance. Now, every Friday, Fiona would get a bus into Wexford Town so that she could meet up with her family for coffee. When she failed to show up for the second week in a row, her family began to worry. I suspect they were worrying probably days before that. As the days went by from February the 9th of her disappearance, it began to dawn on everybody that something was seriously wrong. Fiona's father, Pat, reports his 19-year-old daughter missing in Kilmore Quay, Garda Station, and a missing persons inquiry is launched. He and his wife, Mary, have not seen their daughter in more than 10 days and she has missed several family house call-ins and normal weekly get-togethers with her parents and siblings. He also confirms that his daughter and son, Diane and Seamus, had spoken to Fiona on the house phone on the evening of February the 8th. In the subsequent days after Fiona's disappearance, passing neighbours would later note to Gardy that a number, quite a number, of black bin bags had been piled up outside the house. I'd say, uh, Mick, that's quite significant. The bin bags for people to remember, just for something else. Uh, that's coming up. Especially as we'll later learn, mm. the her daughter Emma was staying at Sean Carroll's parents. That was who was mining the week of her disappearance, and that apparently nobody was in the house so where did these black bin bags come from and who had access to that house February the 27th 1998 which is a Friday Fiona's sister Diane marks her own 21st birthday it is a day as so often most weeks she would be celebrating with her sister Fiona but there's still no trace or contact from Fiona Gardy have now identified their prime suspect and the last known person to see Fiona alive on February 8th 9th. Uh, we're just going to take again some more family footage and this is um, uh, Diane's uh, 21st birthday party. Just very quick footage.
So February 28th, uh, this is a Saturday, Fiona's daughter, Emma, turns one year of age. So my goodness, this family are experiencing celebrations and no Fiona. The family of Fiona Sinnott begin their own private searches in riverways, quarries and coastal areas. And again, courtesy of the family, we're going to take some more family um, footage of their own and these are private searches the family conducted themselves in the opening days and weeks after she was reported missing. We're on to March 1998, so we're gone well over um, a month now. Guardi are certain of their line of inquiry and suspects. Now, I'll, I'll, I'm going to read this slightly slower because there's an awful lot of detail in here. Guardi meet the Welch truck driver, remember him, we mentioned him, Gary James, and he provides a detailed statement of the events at Rosslare Harbour on the night of February 6th two days before her disappearance. His account is checked and verified and he himself is eliminated uh, from the inquiry. As Gardy begin to gather information and conduct interviews, particularly after testing the account of ex-boyfriend Sean Carroll, a series of previous disturbing episodes of domestic and relationship abuse emerges concerning a former partner. I'll leave you to figure out who that is. Local medical and hospital records reveal a consistent pattern of injury sustained by Fiona. Uh, notwithstanding, severely twisted ankle, facial and body bruising, swellings, bites to the leg and a damaged jawbone. Some hospital visits required recommended brief hospitalisation. But on each occasion Fiona insisted on discharging herself and refusing any stayovers. Despite hospital staff attempts, she was often circumspect and unwilling to reveal the proper nature of her injuries. This comes from Wexford General Hospital records obtained by Gardaí. The investigation team began then to review previous local Gardaí calls and visits. And lo and behold, one such call log stood out from female Garda Michelle Power, who had taken a call for assistance. In late 1996, so the previous year, mm -hmm. sorry, uh, two years actually, two male uniformed guardy responded to this call from a witness who reported a distressed woman outside a house not far from Rosslare Harbour. The distressed woman was Fiona Sinnott. The eyewitness related that Fiona had fled from a house after a man had threatened her with a knife. The two guardy escorted Fiona back into the house where she had been staying that evening and found a man asleep and drunk on the sofa. She was allowed to gather her belongings and taken from the house for her own safety. No charges were ever filed following the incident because the young man on the sofa had no previous convictions and Fiona insisted she was not willing to press charges. Further investigation revealed yet another serious assault on Fiona a year earlier to her disappearance. All of this evidence was only discovered in retrospect and now, with Fiona disappeared, no charges could be brought against this man. Gardy already had the results of a technical examination of Fiona's house. Like Fiona's family, they also noticed that it had been stripped bare of a number of personal belongings. It was spotlessly clean, which was considered to be unusual for Fiona. To all intents and purposes, Gardy believed that during the subsequent days after Fiona's disappearance, persons known to her and with access to her house had cleaned and removed all personal items connected to Fiona and her child. This included... Uh, 
clothing and toys. Kieran, yeah, I was going to say there. So when um the when uh, Sean Carroll left the house in the morning or whatever, mm-hmm. when the guards were questioning him, I wonder did they ask him what state was the house in when you left? Was it messy, spotless, clean as they found it? It'd be interesting to hear what his response yeah, would be to that. I, I don't have that full what he claimed or didn't claim um, initially regarding the house and whether way, whether whether he ever claimed that when he left at around about we think 9.30 a.m. on the February the 9th that morning and he went back to his par- I think it was his parents home uh, that his mother drove him to um, whether he ever made any claims that he returned to the house and what access he had to the house key key wise yeah to get yeah together with a report of black bin bags discovered by a local farmer dumped on his property and that he had noted letters of address correspondence had georgia street wexford written on them which is where fiona had previously rented an apartment with her ex-boyfriend sean carroll increasingly guarded began to suspect that somebody was trying to mislead them into thinking that Fiona had simply run away and vacated her barely hit rented house. Unfortunately, well, the farmer yeah. had burned the items, being completely unaware of the missing case of Fiona Sinnott. So it cannot be established if these were the same black bin bags seen outside Fiona's barely hit house in the days immediately after. Kieran, Yeah, I was going to say, I think um, one thing we can say for pretty much 100% certainty is that with the bin bags being found on the farmer's property containing their possessions mm-hmm. that um, it was not a stranger that done this this would be a person known to her there's no way a stranger would take to pack up her belongings and take yeah, them to yeah, a farm yeah, 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 again yeah, 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 yeah. In, in that case then no we're, we're getting into bizarre cases of um, no. here's a person who's disappeared they've gone mm-hmm. missing then lo and behold some bizarre Burglary by somebody completely unaware and unconnected to the house somehow oh, yeah. goes in, gathers <laughs> her belongings, and somehow they turn up in a farmer's field. Like yeah. you know, you're you're stretching <laughs> you're stretching like, imagination yeah. there. Yeah, and you're also like to say this would be a stranger that caused her disappearance would be stretching the imagination F- further. No further imagination, yeah. Yeah, some some stranger wouldn't have ducked there and then pack up her belongings and put them on some. Uh, yeah, because that that's what burglars do, and that's what people who abduct other people do. You know, they they pack up their belongings. You know, who are completely unconnected with that person because, like, it makes perfect sense. No, it doesn't. Yeah, there's doesn't a lot of um, there's a lot of I suppose information. I don't know if that's the correct word with the bin bags. Like, it really yeah. pointed the case in one direction that it was somebody known to her anyway. Of course, yeah. Who that person is, but definitely someone known to her. If that's what's going on. So June 1998, Our Lady's Island Lake, close to where Fiona was last seen walking home, is drained with Gardy keeping a 24-hour floodlit watch as it is emptied. No trace is found of the missing 19-year-old teenager. Now, during 1998, months after, six people are arrested in relation to drug offences in the area of Wexford. This follows information by the MBCI and forwarded to Fiona Sinnott's investigation team. Ooh, I wonder why that information was forwarded to another investigation team. Well, as much as detectives want to solve a separate case, I think it's more a ruse. One of the six, that is, the arrests. One of the six men is their prime suspect, and they hope the interview him as part of the other investigation will shake a few trees and a few apples of evidence will fall. And it paid off. Of the six men, including their suspect, one other is discovered to be known to Fiona at the time of her disappearance, and admits he had provided or occasional lifts in and around the Wexford Ballyhead area. He would later die of a drug overdose years later. And you can figure out the connection here. In 2001, a man suspected by Gardaí and previously interviewed under caution of having been involved in the disposal of Fiona's body dies from a suspected drug overdose. The man in question had been finding it 
increasingly difficult to live with the guilt of being involved. However, he could not provide Angara Shikana with a formal or anonymous tip-off because he believed only three people knew about the exact location of Fiona's whereabouts. Confiding in someone close to him, he said it would be tantamount to signing his own debt warrant and he lived in fear of his life and the person directly connected to her murder, Fiona's murder. In 2004, Fiona's father, Pat, dies of a broken heart. He will never learn the fate of his daughter and what happened. Uh, and that is Pat there in that uh, photograph. Um, we're going to take a, a quick um, insert. Sit, she'd sit there for hours and she's just taken, taken about her. She'd never been the same. It broke the family, sure. My father died of a broken heart, he did, yeah. Somebody missing is a very big gap in your life, like, do you know what I mean? Very big gap. At times then you try not to think about it, you know. It always lingers there, like, do you know what I mean? It was like as if she vanished into thin air, really. It actually gets harder and harder every year as the years go by, knowing that she's still out there somewhere, like, it's just not right, like. So we're just pleading for anyone with information just to come forward, just let us bury her and let our family be whole again. September the 16th, February 2005. Fiona is legally classified as dead, and on September the 16th, Gardy announced that they are now treating the case of missing Fiona Sinnott as a murder investigation. On the same day as the announcement, three men and three women are arrested and questioned in New Ross and then escorted guard stations in relation to Fiona's murder. Some of them are related to Sean Carroll. The arrests include Sean Carroll, the prime suspect, Kitty Carroll, the suspect's mother, the suspect's sister and her boyfriend, an ex-girlfriend of the suspect and a male friend of the suspect. So this, including the prime suspect in the murder of Fiona Sinnott, he is arrested shortly after 7am at his home and detained under Section 4 of the Criminal Justice Act. The primary charge against the six is withholding information. They are all later released without charge. Kieran, <coughs> um, there's a, there was a lot to process in there. Yeah, a lot kind of happened there in, in quite a short. Yeah, I, I think it was like but... boom. She's been <coughs> formally um, recorded as deceased, gone. Now we're free. Now it's a murder investigation. We free up resources, and boom, we're acting now. And then the arrest came. Yeah, and then I suppose um, I don't know. Did they ever prepare a file for the DPP or anything on this case? I, I am not aware. In re direct relationship to Fiona Sinnott's murder, I have no knowledge of. That's not to say it didn't happen, but I certainly have no knowledge of a file specifically with a charge of murder after an arrest going to the DPP for review and coming back to the Gardaí oh, uh, no. I, I certainly am not aware of that mm -hmm. and I want to make that very clear I'm not aware of anything like that no and then I was just going to say I suppose like where it happened Wexford I know the, the, the guards or the cops or whatever they always say when you're looking for someone that's vanished to look for the nearest um, body of water and of water and then um, like Wexford, it's really coastal. Like the whole place is still surrounded by seafront. And unless I'm wrong, like Ballyhit is pretty much on the coast, is it? It's, it's like not. Here. It's not quite on the coast, but it wouldn't be that far away. Uh, like I said, the the, the girls, uh, meaning Fiona and our friends, often um, would 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 use uh, Rosslare as a place to go. You, you know, late at night. It's so it it wasn't. It was you know we saw either a long taxi 
journey away I, or, or a mini bus, you know, away. So, you know, no, it wasn't that far away. And there'd be a lot of um, isolated beaches and stuff in Wexford, especially in February. Yep. That time yeah. of the year. Yeah. Okay. July 2006. Sean Carroll, the ex boyfriend of missing Fiona Sinnott, with an address of Ballyco Boys, Broadway, County Wexford, and also a 42 Woodford. Uh, Castlebridge County Wexford pleaded not guilty before Wexford District Court to a charge that he made a threat to Robert Pask, his cousin, that he would kill or cause him serious harm at Gragean Clinic, County Wexford, on September 19, 2005. Judge Donica of Ucla heard how Sean Carroll called to the home of Robert Pask at 7am where he made verbal threats to him leaving Pascal no doubt that he was in danger during the verbal threat the words used by Carol were you're a dead man I won't be doing it but there is a lad I know who will and I think in it he intimated or pointed over his shoulder um, in, in the, the courtroom when this, this statement was, was, was made Mr. Pask, in his statement, according to Inspector MacDonald, admitted having been involved in a short sexual relationship with Mr. Carroll's sister, Sharon. Robert Pask, who was admitted in evidence as a hostile witness, told the court that he had only returned home from work at 3.30am that morning, and at 7.30am approximately, he answered a knock to the door of his home. Mr. Pask said, he took the threat seriously, so much that he stayed that night with friends, as he did not want to stay in his own home. Earlier that morning he said he made contact with his sister and friends, while later he went to Wexford Garda Station to make a statement, while during the course of the night a friend of his kept watch on the house. He also told the court that he knew Sean Carroll, as he was a first cousin, adding that he was fearful because there was a lot going on at the time. Yeah, boy, there was. For he also felt there was much attention on Carol. Replying to Mr. Langan, solicitor, Mr. Pask said he wanted to withdraw the statement of his own free will, adding that he did not come under any pressure from Carol. He said he went to guard the station to make a complaint, but he didn't originally want to press charges. I just wanted someone to have a word with Mr. Carol to tell him to calm down. He agreed with Mr. Langan's solicitor that everyone had been aware where Carol had been for the previous two days. He'd been in Garda custody in relation to another matter. Everyone in Ireland was aware of that. Sean Carroll was found guilty and sentenced to three months in prison. But on appeal, he was successful in having his conviction and sentence overturned when the defendant asked Gardy to completely withdraw his statement that he'd given. Now, September the 12th, 2008, a plaque is erected in memory of Fiona for a ceremony marking 10 years since her disappearance. The ceremony takes place, but the family discover the plaque had been stolen overnight. They later reinstall a new plaque, and it would not be the first time or last attack on a memorial plaque. Finally, in 2018, the Synods commissioned a third plaque and it was placed closer to the family home in Kilmore Key rather than closer to Fiona's original home in Ballyhit Broadway. Uh, thankfully, this one has so far stood the test of time. Uh, we're going to take a video insert. Um, this is from, I think it's RTE News, uh, about the stealing of that uh, plaque. Yesterday afternoon, workmen erected a marble plaque in memory of 19 years old Fiona Sinnott missing since February 1998. The plaque was to be blessed and unveiled today, but family members discover this morning at 9.30 the plaque had been stolen. It was a big blow for us now for that to happen for us today, you know. Yeah, but we won't give up. Her memory is going to be alive and it's going to stay alive. Gardy are investigating the incident. We've carried out a, a search of the area and we've carried out house to house inquiries in the region. We have a technical examination conducted of the scene and we're anxious to speak to anybody who might have any information regarding this incident. 
It's 10 years since Fiona Sinnott disappeared. She was last seen in the pub adjacent to this small graveyard. Last week was her 30th birthday. That's why her family wanted to erect a memorial plaque to her memory. The monumental sculptor that made the stolen plaque was able to produce a second for Fiona Sinnott's family this morning, in time for today's unveiling ceremony that went ahead at 3 o'clock. Watched by Fiona Sinnott's mother and family, a former Garda diver, Thomas Lavery, who was involved in the search for Fiona, unveiled the plaque, which was blessed by local priest Father Brendan Nolan. Joe McGrealy, RTE News, Bridgetown, County Wexford. Uh, Kieran, yeah, can, we're, 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 we're kind of, we kind of, like ghosts, visit the same places and themes again. Where have we heard this before? Do you remember the uh, Raynard case? Yeah, exact same. Glenda yeah. Geary, same shit again. What yeah. What is the matter with people? Y you know, even if you're accused of something or attention falls upon you, what despicable person, even if you feel completely innocent, would go out and do that. What what even group I mean, of, of teenagers or youths knowing what's gone on in their village, their town, their city would carry out a despicable act like no. that? You can't like kids get our teenagers or whatever yeah. blamed, get blamed on a lot of things, but not this like and like to do this like it's um it's this is like per it's per it's psychotic. psychotic, it's personally yeah. motivated. You know, you, yeah, you're almost then, telegraphing that you're in some way connected, that this is so he, egregious to you that you're actually yeah. going to go out and do that. But, like, people have done awful things to each other in the world and yeah. they don't come back and destroy memorials. Yeah. You know? it, that's, like, adding on extra, extra, like, like yeah. psychoticness. Like, yeah, crazy. Okay. Like that in itself, actually, that should actually be something that should be legislated to. Yeah, carry yeah, yeah. Much perhaps, yeah, a much higher sentence. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah and, and and it should be admissible um, if a case comes to trial on a, a, a related matter of more seriousness. Yeah. That should be admissible, you know, if evidence, if you are yeah. found guilty yeah. of that previous, you know, um, defacing or oh, damaging, yeah. or that should be brought uh, and carried as evidence. Yeah. Uh, June 2015, Fiona's family receives information. They pass it on to Gardy, but the family and friends of Fiona begin a private dig at a site in County Wexford. However, once again, no evidence or remains are found. By December the 2016, Fiona's sister Diane delivers a speech at the National Missing Persons Day in Family House saying, we just want Fiona to have a decent Christian burial where she deserves, which she deserves not the burial place she has at the moment, intimating that she's been dumped somewhere, disposed of somewhere. February to April 2017. In a renewed effort, Gardy began carrying out door-to-door -door inquiries in Broadway County, Wexford, where Fiona was last seen. Gardy state in public appeal that a motorist saw a male and female on the roadway around the time Fiona left Butler's Pub in February 1998. There were reports also to be two males in their late teens or early 20s nearby, yet none of those people have ever come forward. Garthy are, remain anxious to trace their whereabouts. Fiona's home is once again re-examined with more up-to-date forensic equipment and testing. By June 2017, Fiona's older sister Caroline dies in Wales, where she had been living after a short illness. She will be another family member, never to know the true fate of their loved one. February 2018. In a frank interview, Fiona's sister Diane reveals that they think of Fiona's daughter Emma every day and she, she will soon be 22 years of age. But after the disappearance of Fiona, the Sinnott family have had little or no contact with her. For them, there were two victims in this case. After the events of 1998, the Sinnott and Carol family relationship and contact became fractured and access for Pat and Mary Sinnott was limited to arranged hotel visits, one hour every fortnight because Fiona's daughter was now living with Sean's parents. As their granddaughter grew older, all contact eventually ceased. Um, 
Kieran, before I get into the conclusions and analysis. No, uh, thanks. No, great work there again, Mick, with the timeline. Very sad for the parents. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a daughter. shit tragic case. You know, it's one of them that the tragedy just like keeps keeps on going for the family. Like, and then her sister must have died quite young as well. The sister who lived yeah. in Wales. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think what, what was there? I think I said two sons, two sisters that she had. So what? Five, five of them in the family. Um, so yeah, there couldn't have been a, a huge separation in in years in the oh, family. Yeah, her mother's still alive, right? I think. To my knowledge, yes. Yeah, and then so yeah, no, it's a real tragic case, like so. Um, so now hopefully, on this one, I don't know. It's it's hard to say without a body. Like, are they going to are they going to go like the DPP route again, like they did in the Deirdre Jacob case? Mm. You would hope they might do like. Yeah, we'll see. Okay, our conclusions on analysis on this case. Uh, this is pu- these are purely my words. This is not Kieran. We'll, we'll uh, get uh, Kieran's feedback on this case uh, shortly. But there's a few key points I want to mention on this case. Um, look, in doing these deep dive cases, it's not too often that one comes with so much extensive information, and there was in this case. It makes the case. Of Fiona Sinnott an exception particularly in a cold case 26 years old because often we don't have a huge amount to go on just like the last two cases we covered here on Radio Spoil that of Kira Breen and Fiona Pender it is glaring obvious that this case does not belong in any casual media filled story of Ireland's vanishing triangle there's no triangle of intrigue nor any vanishing mystery involved here there is a suspect and there has been within days of the disappearance of Fiona Sinnott. For me, this case isn't so much about the disappearance of a vibrant young woman, but a more endemic issue of domestic abuse operating in plain sight. goes on, and it isn't some societal issue parked and condemned to the 1980s and 1990s in Ireland to be forgotten, a vestige of the passing 20th century. It still permeates cases we've covered, both of us, over the past two decades after 2000 the cases of Imelda Keenan Rachel O'Reilly Elaine O'Hara Fiona Pender Kira Breen and Sandra Collins are identified targeted and preyed upon by someone immediately known to them someone they then or once lightly loved and trusted now in Fiona Sinnott's case she attempted to extract herself from those circumstances she found herself in but never quite did and much of this complicated by the reality, let's face it, we all go through it in life, Not well, not all of us, a lot of us, that the separated couple had an infant daughter together. In examining those same circumstances too often, it is easy to play the victim-blaming game. Asher, what girl or young woman would hang around with that guy and take all that abuse? What was she thinking? Sure, it's the family's fault for not seeing the clear signs of distress and abuse. Sure, it's the guard's fault for not acting on previous incidences and intervening earlier. Sure, it's the fault of the friends for not intervening. These are shameless excuses and societal diversions that do nothing but mitigate the real abusive culprit. And when we look at the case of Fiona Sinnott, we can play the same mitigating game. But, but she should have told her family everything was happening. Um, she shouldn't have been hanging around with people like that. She should have cut off all contact with them. She should have pressed charges at previous times. Her family should have known and stepped in. The guardian and the law are hopeless. But in these words, all the time we are slowly removing the culprit and the instigator from their own direct abuse, behaviour and responsibility. If we look at this case, we are simply playing the game of don't look here, look over there. I'm not going into any more details about this case now. We've laid out the timeline. I'll leave our viewers to make their own conclusions. Like so many of the cases, Kieran and I, present here for Radio Spoil on Irish cold cases. There's an existing suspect and has been for years. We are here to present as many facts as possible in any case, as accurately as we can, not play online games of who done it or carry on some sort of pseudo public trial by media. And we do not entertain wild case conspiracy theories, particularly 
when it becomes clear to us these are driven by personal, moral or even political biases with obvious ulterior motives. We are increasingly seeing that in the comment section of this channel in some of the more high profile cases we cover. And we can spot them a mile away. Kieran knows more about human behaviour probably than I do when a person is giving an opinion on a case in detail and it is clear that they are operating without the full case facts or worse deliberately skewing handpicking information or ignoring information and instead using the case as just a personal plank or path to espouse their own private views and public agendas on could be civil freedoms adversity to common law sexism, Disli di sexism dislike of authorities whatever you pick it that's the agenda we think long and hard about naming case suspects and will often seek legal and police guidance when possible we countenance the position of a victim's family they too have their own unique case embedded experience more recently we have placed a particular focus on the families involved in these cases as well as the victims and how we present our timelines and features i have only two witches in this case of fiona sinnott and that is that the Sinna family will eventually have their own loved one found and her remains back and laid to rest where she belongs and the suspect if the evidence reaches a charge and a court case that he will be afforded or she his plea or her plea and defence under jury scrutiny. None of that will happen without those involved coming forward providing critical information and at least clearing their conscience. Sadly in this case uh, blood can become thicker than water. Whomever was responsible for the disappearance of Fiona Sinnott on her journey from Butler's Bar to her home in February 1998, they knew her. Whether then or thereafter, they had assistance from someone known or close to them. It is very, very rare in cases like Fiona Sinnott's case that someone acts alone in the disappearance throughout. Where potential harm is perpetrated, and motives, movements and tracks are not attempted to be later concealed and help and confidences in such an act is not quickly sought soon after. It's that concealment, the lies, the help and the confidence is sought at that time that have to be broken in cold cases years later. That's my thoughts in this case. Kieran. Yeah, no, I was going to say, thanks, Mick. Um, I agree with everything you say there, about the uh, domestic violence thing and the deflection thing. Like, if someone is a stranger to you, or even if you know them and they're suffering, like, this horrific abuse, why they don't go to people or, or report this or act in this way is, quite frankly, nobody's business for, to start with. And then... And it, and, and it can be done anonymously. It's, it's not like you actually have to put your name on record. You can phone... The Gardaí anonymously give information, they'll quickly pick up, this person knows information that they shouldn't know publicly this person is credible whoever they are they don't want to be known but it's a follow up and it's a significant lead so it still can be done anonymously it doesn't, you don't have to give your name you don't have no. to say come on down and talk to me no and then like like the victim blaming and stuff that goes on in some of these cases, it's very disturbing. Like why people would feel the need to state this online that the person should have done X, Y, and Z mm. when they've never been in that situation. Because I think somebody that was in such a situation would never write these things online. So no, you can't really comment like, and then you can, you can have psychiatrists and all these type of things, but nobody knows unless they suffer this. And then like also there's mental abuse going on. Like, even sometimes more so than the physical abuse is the mental yeah. abuse like the person becomes trapped in the house like yeah for be, all be, because we, we see it in so many of these cases where there may be a suspect a boyfriend uh, a spouse or just a close friend or whatever the circumstances and you see it all the time the motivation whatever the ending is so often about control and controlling that person and it's yeah. it's not acceptable to say oh well he or she um, meaning the victim shouldn't have done that or they should have spoken out or why didn't they tell this that's not the way life often works when you were a no. victim you are you cocoon and hide yourself yeah 
like it's that um as they say you know the hurler on the ditch phrase yeah it's like yeah. Someone doing that yeah. in terms of watching someone being the victim of domestic violence it's a very disturbing yeah thing to do for for me like in my opinion anyway yeah now so back to the case i suppose back to the case like the, the people who are the suspects or whatever they're not that old so there could still be justice in this case and fiona like she does have some siblings still alive and some family and that no, so no, you no, hope no, like, absolutely yeah there will be some sort of justice eventually like but just for just as long as for the mother as long as she's still alive and all that hopefully it happens soon yeah we hope so we hope so um it's another case there was a lot in it and i appreciate for everybody there was a lot of information to process there uh i'm sure for some they're hearing information that they didn't read or see before um that's what we do here when we do deep dives into uh, a case there's no point for us in just doing a case and rehashing information that's already out there we do our best to put together an accurate timeline we don't always get it right and even our our own opinions may not always eventually be perfect accurate or read the case the right way but we can only do it with the information that we have and as i always say look when it comes to comments um under all these cases please be respectful and don't throw out things in comments that are just well just along the points that of both of us kieran and i have just uh, discussed because i'm afraid i am seeing more and more of that kind of throw away three or four word comments um and it's not helpful uh, it's it's like anything if you have nothing of substance and constructive to say then guess what maybe say nothing <laughs> that's true for a lot of life yeah kieran uh, another right. case thank you for joining me yeah. I think we'll great. we'll take a, a week off next week uh, on timelines uh, I, I won't go into detail but there's a number of things happening next week with other cases that I'm hoping that there might be developments on uh, updates uh, court appearances uh, Tina Satchwell's husband is appearing in court next week uh, I touched upon the Christian Bruckner uh, profile um, and there's the Hazel Bean rape case that's coming up uh, the end of next week so there's a lot going on next week I think we'll have some one or two um, uh, pieces about those cases uh, but you'll probably hear from Kieran and I on another in-depth timeline probably towards the end of this month uh, February and until then as always uh, God bless take care and we'll see you again soon